it. Hi. How's it going this morning? Did you get to enjoy our one day of sunshine on Friday? Anybody get out? Anybody get out? Listen, you got you to stay on the bright side of things, right? Ha, ha, ha. So good. There's more coming. We love it. Uh, I like to joke with my wife um, that, uh, you know, she's always like, she's always looking for spring around mid-March. And I was like, Alt, you've lived in upstate New York your whole life. Your whole life. You know, like, I, 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 have, a, I have a rule for me personally. I don't look for spring until after April 15th. And if you're lucky, you might get it for like two or three weeks, and then we're into summer. I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's not much of a, of, a, of a layover time with that. But So, good morning. I'm excited. I'm excited to serve you this morning. Uh, I feel like um, there's just uh, there's a real opportunity this month um, to find out um, what this thing of wholeness is. Uh, turn to your neighbor and say, you've you got to be whole, too. Yeah, um, a few weeks ago, I remember, uh, I remember Scott saying something that um, there's certain phrases that pop out um, to me personally when, when he speaks, um, and one of them was, um, uh, we got to get you right before we get them right. I thought that was fascinating, but, I, but, but so true. Um, you know, how, how many of you know that, Jason even said this last week, how many of you know you can't give what you don't have? And it's difficult it's going to be difficult for us to, as a house, to fulfill an assignment to make an entire region whole if we haven't discovered wholeness for ourselves. Several years ago, there was a book uh, written. Um, it was commissioned by Gabe Lyons, who has gone on to uh, really just formulate one of, the, one of the best thought leader cohorts of our time, especially within the church called Q. And, um, and he... Uh, um, he's, he wanted to figure out, besides just getting everybody saved, what happens if we just got everybody saved? Then what would we do, you know? And, 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 and the, the mission of the church being far above and beyond that. And he commissioned this book from the Barna Group um, with uh, him and David Kinnaman called Unchristian. I don't know, any of you, any of you read that book, Unchristian? It was several years ago. Oh, my goodness, okay. We've got to resurrect that sucker. Well, they did, they did a study of these up-and-coming generations um, both for, and actually really from uh, from boomers and GI all the way all the way through um, down to the millennials uh, and started figuring out okay um, what's the difference between the church and the world and um, shockingly as you might find out by the name of the book unchristian there wasn't much of a difference so the understanding that resulted not just from this book but probably what you and I kind of implicitly knew anyway was that um, why would a world want something that we don't have? Um, I, I said this to the young adults when I was beating them up a few, a few weeks ago on this whole idea of pursuing wholeness. I said, it's like, it's like running around with the flu, telling everyone to get their flu vaccine or get their Tamiflu, but you don't take it yourself. Isn't that just like the picture of hypocrisy? Why would we run around saying, like, get the cure, get the cure, get the cure? <coughs> so um, we have this opportunity. Now we're here in this series called Whole. Somebody say whole. We have the opportunity to get whole. Somebody say whole. And what's in front of us is the understanding, and I love it. We've even kind of built it into our branding for the series, that it's not just Body wholeness is not just spirit wholeness. It's not just soul wholeness. It's the whole three, all three taken together. Jason did a brilliant job last week. How many of you were just, it was, last week was like one colossal mic drop, right? And one of the things I really took out of Jason's time is that if you take, if you take body, soul, spirit, and I promise I am actually going to write on this. You take body, soul, spirit, and you, and you take out just one like uh, make one element in each, in just two categories, unhealthy, how the whole of our person can become unhealthy. And that you can be really spiritually vibrant, and yet if your soul's not in order, if your emotions aren't healthy, if, you're, if your body's not healthy, think about, the, anybody ever have the flu? <laughs> how were you emotionally during that time? 
I mean, it's like, you're, yes, you're physically drained, but like, there's very few people that, are, that walk through a flu with. So we have this, we have this tremendous opportunity this month. And I love, I love the way Scott kicked it off. He, he doubled in, he, he like gave us a, a one-two punch with, with an Easter message, but at the same time talking about becoming whole, that Jesus, what he paid for was body, soul, and spirit. Jason coming in, bringing us this whole um, mic drop after mic drop message on emotional wholeness and wellness. And, and, uh, and here we are. I want to um, I want to kind of unpack this idea of spiritual health, but I want to I want to talk specifically in a couple different areas. And one, one of the places I want to start this morning um, is the idea that, yes, all three of these are interrelated. Um, and so if you're taking notes, and I hope that you are, because to be let's be honest, um, when we uh, if I'm going to be talking, you're probably going to want to take notes. It's just the it's just the way I it's just the way I work. It's okay if um, it's okay if that's not the way you work. Um, and if you're waiting for some scripture, we're going to be hitting Acts three in just a second here. Okay. So we find out in the same way that God is a triune being; He is Father, Son, and Spirit. That. Likewise, he made us as whole triune beings ourselves. No, I don't believe that we're God. Don't, don't hear me that, that we're going to replace some member or be, have, be some fourth, fourth hidden member of the Godhead. But one of the things that we can do is we can begin to look at how these three interrelate. And I got to say this first. We're going to be talking separately today, next Sunday, and the following Sunday, specifically about the three different parts of this. But remember, okay, remember what Jesus taught us. It's all connected. It's all interwoven. Thanks, bro. So don't, don't allow yourself to compartmentalize too much because there's a lot of overlap between all these things. So one of the things that I want to, want to kind of hit on right, um, right off the bat is... When we talk about our whole person, sometimes one of the confusions that we have in the body of Christ is because of how we've read scripture, we think the body is bad. Your bodies are not inherently bad. God made Adam, male and female, and at the end of that sixth day, he looked on all of it and he said, it's very good. He was including your physical frame in that in that label in that assessment. Are you okay? The reason that we often misunderstand is because these two words are two different things, both in scripture and in actuality. So when Galatians says, be led by the spirit and you won't carry out the desire of the flesh, it's not saying be led by the spirit so that you can chastise your body. So that you can think less, so you can think less of your physical person, and more of your spirit. He's saying, when he's talking about flesh, he's talking about the mind set on the flesh. It is a mindset where we do a lot of the things we used to do when we weren't saved. When we weren't saved. So the, he goes on to say, the deeds of the flesh are evident. Things like fornication, things like dissensions, and 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 uh, disputes, um, and outbursts of anger. He goes on to list a whole bunch of things that happen. So if you go through that Galatians 5 list and you see something that really isn't, isn't all that beautiful and you find out sometimes that happens in your life, doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means that you're walking in the flesh. I want to I hit this real fast. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, if, as, if, as if that list wasn't exhaustive enough. And he's like, and anything like it. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I want to free some of you this morning. Some of you are so performance-driven. Me too. Okay? This is something I'm still overcoming in my life. Some of you are so performance-driven that when you make one mistake in any one of those categories, you instantly disqualify yourself from walking in the things of the Lord. And you think, oh, I blew it again. Why, why don't you just give up on me? I'm giving up on me. I'm done. I'm out. Because you made one, one mistake. Did you see what the word said here? 
that those who practice such things. Listen, he's not expecting you to be perfect. He's making you perfect. He's making you complete. He's making you continually more whole, more whole, more whole. One of the, thing, one of the scripture Scott loves to use all the time, we're moving from faith to faith. We're moving from glory to glory. You're going to trip up every now and then. Did anyone? I, I hope you didn't do this, so please don't answer to the affirmative if this was you. Did you ever, when, you're, when your child was learning to walk, be like, oh, you tripped again. Watch out, there's a foot there. No, you didn't. You didn't do that. You're like, God, you took three more steps. Do you understand? We're evil by comparison to him. And if we're looking at our children and saying, you took three more steps, how much better is he celebrating our progress towards wholeness? He's not saying, oh, bah, gah, bah. You fell again? Seriously, I told you 18 times. No, he's saying, you're still going after 18 times. It's awesome. Keep going. All right. So there's a delineation. My wife is going to unpack this in a couple weeks, so I'm not going to talk too much more about the body, but I just want to delineate. Somebody say, body, good. Flesh mindset, bad. Okay, now. Scripture says that before Christ, before the anointed one, before the one who carries the wind of the spirit and the anointing oil of heaven, before he came on us, before he came into us, it says that we were dead in our transgressions. Now turn to your neighbor and say, you were dead. Just going to say Tiger. And so there was a time where that wasn't happening. You had a hole there. No pun intended. I really didn't mean that. There was a time where we were scoring zero in the spirit column because the nature of how we were born into the world was to be led only by our soul or by flesh mindsets. And largely these are attached to what we know as the world. If you've ever been confused why it says God so loved the world, when later on a scripture says don't love the world, it's saying don't allow your mindsets to be influenced by the world. In the meantime, Get your heart position, get yourself whole so that when you go into the world, you can bring the light and the love and the life of Jesus into that place. Because that's his heart, is to pursue it. It's to pursue the people in it. So at one point, we were dead in our transgressions. I had, I, I initially had a lot of trouble thinking, how do I talk about becoming whole spiritually in the context of all this, when once you're saved, your spirit is whole? Like when you receive Holy Spirit in your person, there's no fracturing. It's not like you receive part of Holy Spirit. You receive the full measure. You receive the person of God inside of you, waking you up. So I thought like, how do I talk about becoming whole spiritually? And then I thought, oh, wait, what if we're not whole spiritually? We'll get there. So we've got our body, which is good. Somebody say good. It's good. We've got our flesh, which means it's not our, again, this is not our physical being. We're talking about mind, the mindset set on the flesh. How do you know if you're operating in the flesh? Oftentimes, if your decisions are very short-term oriented, I want it now. If they are impulsive by nature, if they are reactive by nature, if you find yourself making certain, um, example, 
if somebody puts a plate of very fudgy brownies in front of me, I will find myself making very short-term oriented decisions. Selah. I'm going to come back to the Spirit in a second. We also find out in Scripture that our soul is largely, there's arguments around this, and it's okay because it's all really in there. Our soul is comprised of three different types of influences. My mind, my will, and my emotions. It's very easy to look at an entire people group in our nation or in culture, in the world, in, in people groups all over the world and say, wow, if they're dead in their spirit and we don't ever get everyone saved, how much hope can we possibly have for humanity? Here's the, here's the thing with that. Pocketed inside here, and this is one of the things that's often a source of debate, is conscience. It's one of the reasons why you see teachers all the time in public school in different situations trying to train young people to make choices. They inherently understand. Teachers, teachers get that in between stimulus and response is a choice. And if we can train young people from the point that they are stimulated or they are provoked into a certain type of behavior, if we can get them to slow down long enough in their mind to make a choice, they'll usually make the right choice. Thank you. So, hence the reason why you can grow up around people and say, well, they're not saved, but they're a really good person. Do you know why? Because they learned... how to make good choices, how to expand the time between something that would normally provoke them and their response, and now they're actually thinking ahead rather than just in that moment. But still, there's not a lot of hope here because how many of you know these can get really loud? I mean, really loud. You ever experienced things like betrayal? tragedy, frustration, feeling trapped. Like, I have no options in this situation. Anybody ever feel that way? How loud were those emotions? How easy was it for you during that time to be like, okay, I'm going to slow down. I'm just going to really think through these situations. Not so much. It's because they can get really, really loud. Manny's going to unpack this idea next week. I think it's next week. Are you on next week? Yep, cool. On soul health. So, again, not going to spend too much time there because I want to swing back now. If we are whole beings, if we are spirit, soul, and body, at some point we got to figure out what is this role in my wholeness? Job number one, <laughs> in simplest terms, Get right with Jesus. When we were dead in our transgressions, our tigers, back here, we had no choice but to be really influenced by our flesh mindsets and our emotions. So if you, if you were able as a young person to cultivate in your mind a real sense of all right, I'm not going to just be provoked by everything. I'm going, to make, I'm going to make concrete, intentional choices before I go into this situation, before I go into this situation, etc. Then, bravo to you. But you had a whole lot working against you because we were born into what? The Bible calls sin or a sin nature. Now, here's where it gets crazy. The Godhead gets together, and mind you, they didn't get together after wringing their hands for centuries. They got together at the beginning of unrecorded time. It says of Jesus that he was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. 
they already had the answer figured out long before you and I were even a glint in our mama's eye. And they said, well, just in case this goes south, let's make a way so that once they're dead in their transgressions, they can come alive again. So Jesus comes, and if you actually, if you do a study on this, you'll actually find out that Jesus, what he did on the cross, this is why I love the word sozo, which means saved, healed, set free. It's the, it's the salvation of the whole person. If you study the word sin, um, or in, uh, specifically, um, and specifically the word evil, so when it says, um, Lord, deliver us from evil, in, the, in what we call the Lord's Prayer, that word evil, if you draw that back, has connotations of deliver us from poverty, deliver us from evil in terms of our soul, in terms of our spirit condition, and deliver us from physical and emotional damage. So when Jesus comes on the scene, he's like, all right, I'm going to sweep through, and I'm going, to, I'm going to make this come alive. I'm going to make a way for this to be healed, and even for this to be healed. He started rocking this kind of healing and this kind of healing, even when he was walking around. But here's, man, here's the clincher. When our spirit came alive, we now had a new vehicle, the most powerful vehicle of influence in our lives. Two things happened. It would have been enough if he had just canceled out our sin issue. But in the same swoop that he canceled out the sin issue, we also became the righteousness of God in Christ. Guys, same chess move. I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, right at the end of the chapter, it says, he became sin. Jesus took it all right here. Became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And in that moment, when you said, yes, Lord, somebody say, yes, Lord. In the moment that you said, yes, Lord, your spirit came alive and you became the righteousness of God in Christ. He absolutely broke not just that power, he broke it off of you. All of the, all of the hard wiring that was in your mind in terms of how to do life, he broke it. It's done. It's like, you know those really frustrating uh, um, operating system updates that, like, that, that Apple likes to do? Maybe, I don't know, I'm, I haven't been an Android user in years. So, like, Android or Mac folks, it doesn't matter. You know how they'll be like, hey, we're going to update your phone for, like, eight hours. And, like, you click the wrong button, and it starts in the middle of the day. All right? And you're like, I needed my phone! Best upgrade ever. No, no, no. <laughs> Follow me. When your phone updates its operating system, it takes like eight hours, right? And you get done, and you're like, your text messaging software is like completely different. You got to figure out how to use it. You know, and like, they jacked three of your apps, and they like deleted five of them. And you're like, this was supposed to be an update hours, and now I have to learn how to use my phone again. This update's not like that. This update was, all right, cancel this, download this, one second. The moment you said, yes, Lord. Well, Sean, aren't I, aren't I supposed to say a prayer and, you know, feel really bad about things? You can if, 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 the, if the thing that's, you know, killing you right now is, is sin issues or just, you know, brokenheartedness or whatever. But he didn't require that. He said, yes, Lord. And I'm using the name Lord on purpose. See, a lot of us are okay. Are you guys okay? 
Are you tired? You seem a little tired. All right. It's all good, though, because um, I, I, I had a cup of coffee with no breakfast this morning, so I've got enough energy for all of us. <laughs> See, when Jesus came, he was really okay being a savior and a deliverer. And he went around being a savior and a deliverer to a lot of people. He would, go, he would, he would have people come to him, and, um, and they're wanting to be made physically well, and he would say stuff like, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> it, almost like just to tick off the Pharisees, right? Listen, if you ever, you'll, you'll, know, you'll know like Pharise, Pharisee-type spirits in your life um, when, you're, when you're encountering them in, in other people because they'll make the gospel really complicated. Like when it's, when it's, when it's, when you make it too easy, it ticks them off. God can't love us that much. He's not that good. So, yeah, I know. I thought that was cool too. So Jesus went around all the time, healing people, healing people, healing people, healing people, saving people, delivering people. I mean, how many demons did that guy cast out? And I love this. At one point, his disciples came up to him. And this is like when Jesus' mojo was at the top of its height, right? I mean, it's, it's at its height. And he's like, hey, these people were casting out demons in your name, and we told them to knock it off. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. This is just how good my dad is. Sorry. Let me, let me see the actual scripture reference right there. He says this. He's like, if they're not against us, they're for us. Okay? You ready for the subtext? My dad's so good that when you guys are operating at full strength, other people will be able to cast out demons in my name too. And they won't even have to know me. Now, before you run with that theology and be like, whoa, I guess I don't need Jesus to be Lord. Wait, 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 wait. Because one of the most line in the sand scriptures that we have is in Matthew 7, it's right around verse 24. And it says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do many miracles in your name? He's like, I don't know you. I mean, it sounds good, but I don't, I don't really know you. So here we got Jesus the Riddler. On one end, sorry, not the villain from Batman, okay? So, on one hand, he's okay with not non-believers doing miracles and signs and wonders in his name. On the other hand, he's really clear that that's not enough. That actually what has to happen is I have to make a faith gesture towards trusting him with my life. I kind of think Jesus came at a time in history when the word Lord would be used because you and I, these days, we don't really have a term for Lord. Yeah, we got landlord, but it's not like the landlord is telling you what to do with your time. Your landlord might tell you when to give him his money for rent. But we don't really have a term nowadays for somebody who we would completely entrust our lives to. It says that we, when we were no longer slaves to sin, we became slaves to righteousness. We're all, ooh. We are, well, I'll use a lighter term. We're all influenced by something. We're all really strongly influenced by something. And Jesus is saying, are you going to be strongly influenced here or strongly influenced here? Because I can be a savior to you. I can cancel your debt of sin. I can heal your body, I can heal your emotions, and I can even, I can cast out demons that are absolutely riddling your mind with guilt, with pain, with suffering. But the only way that I can transform you is if you say yes. If you say I trust you. 
let me up the ante just to make sure that I make this really hard. Giving up even your decision-making ability. Well, Sean, doesn't that make me a robot? No, it doesn't. Shockingly, you'll find it the most freeing thing you've ever done in your entire life. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to put up a mirror that I've put up in front of myself countless times. How many of you are good at running your own life, just you? No, you're not. There's not a single one of us on our best day that can make the best decisions from one end of our life to the other and and make no mistakes whatsoever. To say... To say nothing of the idea of making all of the choices that would check every single box that would move us towards our God-given destiny purposes. On our best day, we can't do that. Think about the last time you had a, a rough week, okay? As we like to say in my house, mama's had a day. And think about... How many of those things that made that week that week and that day that day were really just decisions that you made? Me too. I notice that when I don't go to sleep early enough, uh, this is going to be super basic and almost silly. When I don't go to sleep early enough, I don't get up early enough so that I can get my butt to the gym in time so that I can come back and make breakfast and actually have some margin of time with my child before I go off to work. Usually it's more like um, I want to go to bed maybe somewhere around 11 o'clock, but I might not get to bed until 12.30 or 1 o'clock. See, some of you are smiling because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Others of you, you're not smiling because you're like, oh, I would never do that. Yes, you would. All right, so instead, so I go to bed way too late, and then whereas I wanted to get up at 6 o'clock, I end up getting up at closer to like 7.30 or 8, and then I'm rushing around to get everything done. Meanwhile, um, I've missed the opportunity to make breakfast. I've missed the opportunity to have margin with my daughter. I've missed the opportunity to go to the gym, all because one choice. And now I don't have the endorphins coursing through my system, and now, you know, like now the day is just not starting off the same way. And I haven't even gotten out the, uh, the door to go to work. Insert your story wherever that works for you, because we all do it. Largely because the question always comes back here. Is he really that to me? Have I completely said, Lord, I trust you? Have I made that? am Am I there? Am I absolutely convinced that what he says goes? You'll know, um, you'll know this is happening or beginning to happen when you encounter scripture that doesn't jive with your life choices. You'll, um, you'll know he's Lord when, um, let's see, what's another good one? Oh, my favorite. Um, we'll just call this the ahem moment. You go to make a choice. You're like, oh, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And you hear this. And he says something like, were you planning on talking to me about that? Listen, I'm I'm an Eric Johnson fan. I love, and I believe what Eric Johnson says when he says, in the kingdom, most of the lights are green, not red. So there's, there's a whole lot of freedom. But... Gang, this is the first stop. A lot of people got Jesus as Savior. Not going to heaven. Maybe. They ride the line. They might. They might not. Is he merciful? Absolutely. Mercy triumphs over judgment. But how, how, close, how close do you want to get to heaven? How close do you want to get to hell and just kind of ride that line? If it was about going to heaven, then... Man, I'll just I'll I'll um I'll just go to confession. I love my Catholics. Anybody grow up Catholic in here? Love my Catholics. Love my Catholic background. I can look back now and say, my gosh, they had so many things right. One thing that I always felt when I came out of the confessional, even though it was always like dark and dingy and weird, you know what? I always felt clean. 
Do you ever feel that way? Like any, any of you that grew up Catholic, like you would come out of the confessional and be like, I, I, feel, I feel like clean. You know, it's like, wow, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. It's amazing. That actually works. Like, because I would deal with this situation. No, I didn't know what was happening. I had no idea. Because I didn't know him. Once you know him, <laughs> you don't have to keep going back for this over and 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 over. Why? Because he's really, really simple. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Boom, done, every time. Head over to Acts 3 with me. I told you I'd get there. (laughs) Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Somebody say Beautiful to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. We're pastors. But what I do have, I give you. (laughs) In the name of Jesus Christ Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, somebody say leaping, he stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Do you understand what just happened? One moment, one encounter, with just a couple dudes who were carrying the presence. And notice, he was physically infirm. But when he got up, he was walking, leaping, and praising God. He was walking. He was physically healed. He was leaping. He was emotionally healed. He was praising God. He was spiritually healed. You got it. We got to get this. We, I say we on purpose. Me too. He wants us fully healed. Somebody say fully it's not enough. See, Jesus is walking around. I sometimes wonder, was Jesus ever frustrated at the lack of press through? He's going around, healing bodies, delivering souls, left and right, boom, 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 boom. And we get one little glimpse into, into Jesus' mindset on this whole thing because he, 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 he comes up against 10 lepers, He's like, and he just gives them a word. He's like, go show yourselves to the priest. And it says, as they were, as they were going to the priest, they were, they were healed. Lepers, healed, physically healed. One of them's walking along. One out of 10. I'm, I'm healed. And only one out of the 10 has the wherewithal to go back to Jesus and say, what did you do? Sorry, that's Sean Anderson's version. That's not actually how scripture records it. It's like, my gosh, throws himself at Jesus' feet. And Jesus says, Jesus releases a word over this guy that he did not release over the other nine that he said, the word says cleansed, okay, physically cleansed. He said, go your way, you've been made sozo. You've been made whole. Jesus is okay being savior, but he's really intent on getting to this spot? Because then he knows, oh, we've got relationship now. You're not just in this for a short-term benefit. You're not just in this because I'm your go-to every time you feel bad. You're in this because now you're about us. You and me, I and you. All roads lead to John 15. Just check out that, that area of scripture sometime. So what's happening? <laughs> it's so funny. 
as a teacher, I hardly ever, <laughs> just because it's just, it's, it's not just not in my wheelhouse. It's just not something that is always on the forefront, for, forefront of my mind. Um, but I feel like, Jesus wants to become real to some of us this morning. And I'll put it a different way. Do you know how we're always saying around here that God's interest, interested in us belonging before we believe, before we behave? You guys, we've heard this, right? I want to give an opportunity for those of you that have been around here long enough that you already feel like you belong to make a declaration that now you believe. I just want to, I want to give that opportunity. And here's the thing, to be honest with you, worship preached this message this morning. I don't know if you, I don't know if you know, it was just all the, all the lyrics this morning. I was like, oh, this is so in line with where the Lord's going today. This is so exciting. But I really feel like this morning, I think God wants to wake some of us up make us brand new creations. The word says that when he comes inside of you, several different things happen. You're no longer a slave to sin, now you're a slave to righteousness. Does that mean I have to obey a taskmaster named righteousness? No, it means that now your software is rewritten to think rightly before God rather than the opposite. Scripture says that people who are, who are saved, where their spirit has come alive, it says that you are now seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. This is why it says in 2 Corinthians 5 that you're a new creation. Somebody say, you're a new species. How do I know this? If you're seated in heavenly places while you're seated in that seat right there, you're, you are one of a breed of, of, of creature. I'm just going to use the word creature that can live in two places at the same time. For those of you who want to get really like uber spiritual about this, you live in two dimensions at the same time. For you geeks in the room, I like to think of it this way. You're seated here, but you're also seated like on the Jedi Council of Heaven. You ever notice like, like in, in those films, like how restful they were? I want to release some words over you this morning. Then I, want to give, I want to give an opportunity for those of us that want to cross the line. I want to roll back just for a second. I want to make sure... that you hear what I'm not saying as well. I'm not saying don't get healed. In fact, I feel like some of you, um, uh, some of you that have, as you, as you come to the altar this morning, I feel like some of you are gonna get physically healed and it's gonna be your first sign of just how much he is absolutely invested in your wholeness. Okay, wow. I feel like some of you are gonna approach the altar this morning um, to get prayer because there have been um, folks in the body of Christ call it a foreboding spirit. Uh, if you find yourself throughout your day or throughout your week constantly having thoughts that are like tragic they're, they're like, they're, you're constantly thinking negative thoughts, but they're not yours. Like you can tell like, why did I just think about like that person jabbing that person with a knife? Like, why did I think about so-and-so dying in a car crash when they go home this afternoon? Like you, you've been, you've been, you've been like, your mind has been consumed with those types of thoughts for days, weeks, or years. I feel like the Lord wants to break that this morning. Some of you have had, had that kind of oppression. Guys, it's not you. That's an enemy spirit that's trying to deposit certain words into your mind and into your heart. Trying to get you to think in, in, that, in that kind of perversion. See, it's his goodness here. It's his goodness here. It's his goodness here that leads us to trust him to become this to us. Holy Spirit, all over this room, yeah, <laughs> all, over this room. 
all over this room, I see you drawing chalk lines in front of us, in front of individuals all over this room. I, I, I feel like six or seven at least. Chalk lines, chalk lines. You're, 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 you're literally drawing lines. <laughs> and, I, and I hear you saying, these are trust fall lines. These are trust fall lines. Come on, like Indiana Jones, you know, like we're, talk, we're talking about like that, that spot where um, he, he had to leap across the cavern. If you guys remember that movie, um, that um, he had this spot where he had to take a, a, a step of faith off of a ledge onto what seemed like nothing. Only to find that in crossing that line, boom, oh, my feet is on solid ground. I see chalk lines in front of so many of us in this room. Because here's the thing, you've heard the gospel of belonging. You've heard the gospel of family. You've heard the gospel of the kingdom. You've heard in this house what it means to belong. Now I wanna know, are you ready to believe? Are you ready to trust him? Are you ready to put the faith for even your decision-making itself in his hands? one of my heroes likes to say it this way. Is there anybody in the room this morning, I'm gonna go from your right to my left. Is there anybody in this room you don't wanna leave this morning without knowing you're right with Jesus? Go ahead and put your hand in the air if that's you. You just wanna know, you wanna know. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Come on, I'm gonna wait, four, awesome, five. Praise, praise him. I think I saw a sixth. I see young people raising their hands in this room, that's awesome. Awesome. Prayer team, go ahead and come on up. Come on up. I know, I know Curtis will call you up anyway, but I just want to get you here. So listen, if you raise your hand, I want you to just start walking. Just start walking. Cross the line. Cross the line. Don't wait. Cross the line. Awesome. Come on. I'm praying. I'm, come on. Can we welcome him? I want to welcome him right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's welcome him into the kingdom. Come on. Come on, this is, this is Eli. This is first fruits this morning. Somebody say first fruits. Come on, you guys just witnessed a miracle. You just witnessed our first miracle of the morning. When somebody turns towards the Lord and says there's more joy, there's joy, 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 joy in heaven. Eli, I release over you this morning that heaven is happy about you. Your name means God is exalted and I release over you that God is gonna be exalted in your life. This was not a one-time thing, buddy. This is, you get, to, you get to do a journey with Jesus now. I release Holy Spirit right now. Prayer team, just release Holy Spirit. Feel free to pray for people, but just release Holy Spirit. Come on. Holy Spirit, you are Emmanuel. You are God with us. Call hallelujah. So good. So good. I bless the boldness. I bless the favor. I love it. I love this man's heart. Bless the favor. Bless him, bless him, bless him, bless him. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you, Yeshua. Holy Spirit, fill him up right now. Fill him up. Fill him up, Lord. Fill him up. Fill him up, fill him up, fill him up. God, I thank you. Fill him up. Saints, I'm going to count to three, and I want us to get raucously loud. We're going to we're going to we're going to echo the joy of heaven for ones crossing the line. Somebody say, "Cross the line!" Come on, somebody in this house to, this morning say, "I'm crossing the line today." Come on, we're crossing the line. I'm going to give you a count of three. We're going to get loud as heaven's getting loud. Heaven's singing over us this morning. One. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you for doing what we could have never done for ourselves. Thank you for transforming us from the inside out, too. God, release over this house a new banner of joy as you dance over us with raucous joy. Release over this house a new banner of joy, being able to recognize when transformational moments happen in our lives. Three, come on, get to your feet. Hallelujah. Come on, get to your feet. Come on, let's welcome these saints. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God.